Thank you so much for the prayer. Um, it is good to be here this morning with y'all. Um, Brother Meaner is our state overseer, Brother Jernigan, our guest speaker, our general overseer, Brother Pimentel. It is good to be here with you. Um, I've done some weeping over this message. And the reason is, is because, and I'm hoping maybe you'll understand in a little while, God showed me some things about me and how blessed I really am. The scripture that we're using says, but you are a chosen generation. I want to focus on two of the words in this. The first word I want to focus on is but. The word but here denotes a difference. It was this way, but now it's this way. The first thing that came to mind was back in the 50s, this is what a car looked like, and this is what it was. It was a gas guzzler, but now these are what the cars look like, and they're better than they were back in the 50s. So there's a difference. So the first thing I want to look at is the difference. The first thing. And let's look at some of these scriptures right here. He's talking about, in verse 7, he says, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, Peter wasn't talking about a bunch of heathens that didn't know nothing about God. He was talking about folks that were under a covenant relationship with God. And I thought to myself, how can you get to that place that you become so religious that you basically tell God, we've got our religion, we don't need you. Because that's what they did to Jesus. They argued with him. At every point, they, they contended. They called him a devil at one point because he was doing miracles. I don't know about you, Brother Andrews, but if I've seen a miracle right here, right now. <laughs> I don't think I want to say the devil was involved in it. So we see a group of people who knew the Word. They knew God. But somehow they got into a spirit of disobedience. And you know, sometimes we worry about the world, but I'm telling you, there's a trap for us that we better not become so religious that we can tell God we really don't need you. Because it can happen to any of us. God help us. That we don't fall into that trap that these individuals fell into. To the place that when Jesus stood before Pilate and he gave them a choice, he goes, you want this murder released or you want Jesus released? They said, crucify Jesus. We'll take Bar Barabbas. And he washed his hands and he said, I'm washing my hands in this way. He said, let his blood be on us and on our generations. And when you tell God something like that, you can best believe he's going to keep your word to him. Because that group of God's people has suffered incredibly for the last several centuries since that day that Jesus was crucified. So we see this religious rigidity, this rigid religious structure Jesus called them hypocrites. You're white as sepulchers, but you're full of dead men's bones. He said you can pass land and sea to gain a proselyte. And when you're done with him, he's twice as ready for hell as you are. Why? Because all you did was you made him religious. He has no relationship with God. And this is why God created Adam and Eve. And this is why God sent Jesus. It's all about the relationship. And they had no relationship with God. They had a relationship with the Word. Blessing. 
Now that's the hard part of this message. I'm going to get into the fun part. This was this was this this thing that we have to avoid. We can't fall into this trap. The world needs to see. Let me tell you something. The world's seeing plenty of religion. Look what's going on over in the Middle East. You want religion and you want to see how religion operates? There's some people so religious they'll drive a car bomb into a bunch of folks and blow them up. <coughs> you want religion? There's religion out there. But let me tell you something. I wasn't brought to the church by religion. I wasn't one of the church by religion. And I don't plan on leaving this world with religion. I want something more. I want something with God. Amen. We should hunger and thirst for that righteousness that Jesus talked about. And nothing less, nothing will settle, nothing will, will suffice that. Well, I got all kinds of time. I was supposed to start 20 to 10. That's only 20 minutes. I want to give God his time. I want to go to this other word in this. And that word is chosen. As I thought about this word chosen, I went back to when we were kids. Remember when you were kids and, you know, everybody got together and we needed to choose up sides for a ball game? And, uh, of course, everybody stood in line. We'd pick two captains and the captains would take turns choosing. And, uh, the, what was the choosing based on? The choosing was based on there were some kids that were just good ball players. And those are the guys you wanted on your team. Now we had this little thing going uh, with some of the guys in the state. We play fantasy football. And when we have our draft, we want to find the best players. We want to choose the best players. And I thought about this idea of being chosen. And when we were children, the ones that were the best athletes or the ones that we thought could help us win, those were the ones we chose. I always felt bad for the kids that wanted to play so bad, but they were the ones that got chosen last. And a lot of times, even when they were chosen, a lot of times all they did was ride the bench because they weren't maybe good enough or they just, they weren't what we thought could help us win. And I thought about that. Brother Andrews. And then I read a little bit farther. Down in later in that verse it says that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I thought to myself, why did God choose me? Why did God choose you? And I went back to my own experience. Sister Laura and I did not grow up in the church. We grew up in traditional religion, Catholic, Methodist. Through a series of circumstances that only God could have operated, orchestrated, we came to the church. Some of you have probably heard this story. We had been to a number of churches. Sister Laura and I moved down to Nashville in 1981. We just got married. I had every intention of coming down here being a songwriter. And, uh, but through circumstances, we ended up coming to the church. We had visited a number of churches. But in Christmas 1982, the first time we visited the Church of God, there was a spirit there. And this is what I, how I explained to Sister Anders. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew it when I found it. And that's the only way I can explain it. And so we started coming to the church. A few months later, we came to Brother Dupree, who was our pastor, and told me we wanted to join. And of course, we was about as lost as you could be. About as just ignorant as you can be. As I always said, lost is last year's Easter egg. And so Brother Dupree came to us. 
And he started talking to us about doctrine. And we realized at that point we couldn't join. Brother Dupree could have taken a couple roads. He could have taken one road and said, well, just come on and join. We'll get the rest of it worked out. Or he could have went down the other road and said, well, you'll never be in our church driving through. We won't be able to use you. But his advice was, everybody loves you. Just keep coming. And so that's what we would do. Sunday mornings, we would get on Thompson Lane and we were heading towards St. Edwards, which is the Catholic Church. And we take a left on Foster down to that little church and we kept coming because we felt love. Right. Easter morning, 1983, sunrise service, we came in to unsaved people. Brother Dupree come up to us and he said, could you sing a song for us this morning? And we said, sure. Sister Laura had wrote a song a couple weeks earlier. Basically, the song was, I Need You, Lord. And so we get up and we sang that song, but 34 years later, we still hadn't finished it. Because in the middle of that song, the spirit just fell. Who was there that morning? Thank you all. Thank you all for loving us. Thank you all also for staying out of God's way. They had enough wisdom to just love us and stay out of God's way and let God do something. Because you see, this is the thing that's important to understand in these scriptures here. This, and I don't know about you, and I want you to think about when the Lord saved you. This was a supernatural event. It was inexplainable. I couldn't explain to you why Sister Laura and I were singing and playing the guitar. And all of a sudden, she just stopped playing the guitar and we fell on the altar and got saved. It was a supernatural event. And the reason I was so weepy about this message, as I thought about it, Brother Anders, God didn't choose me because I had some kind of talent. I mean, if I was that talented, I'd be a millionaire writing songs 34 years later. It wasn't talent. It certainly wasn't smarts. It wasn't because I was so good looking. Well, you can laugh, but we all kind of in that boat. I don't know. I personally think y'all are beautiful. But I was like the kid who everybody else had been chosen. I had nothing. And it's not just me, but it's all of us. We had nothing to bring to God except our filthy rags of self-righteousness. We had nothing to bring to Him. And I don't know, understand why He chose us. I can't even fathom it. Why would you choose me, God? Why would you choose us? I don't get it. But in that kind of realization, we wouldn't have enough talent. There's a lot of talent here in this building. There wouldn't be enough talent. There wouldn't be enough intellect. There wouldn't be enough. We couldn't be good enough. We couldn't be, we couldn't be smart enough. We couldn't be talented enough. God just chose us. You know why? This is why. This is what the scripture says. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, we just think too much of ourselves sometimes. I don't, I'm not trying to be hard. I want us to think. I want us to think because, you know, I've been in this 34 years now. You know, the top, of that, the top of that chapter says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, 
and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. I hate to say that in the 34 years that I've been in the church, there has been times when I've seen some malice, when I've seen some guile, when I've seen some hypocrisy and envies and evil speakings. But let me tell you something. When you're brought into the light, those things need to dissipate. This is what Peter said just above there. Verse 22 of chapter 1. He said, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That's what happens when you're brought into the light. The first thing we need to understand is there's no, there's no logical reason that I would even be chosen or that you would even be chosen. But then the next logical thing as we grasp that and understand that and realize how blessed we are. I love how little children are. They can squabble one minute and they love one another the next minute. We're human beings. It ain't going to mean we're going to agree with one another all the time. Brother Cam and I, he's, he's about the closest friend as I've got, but there's times we disagree. I remember years ago when we were young and full of them and bigger. Now we're just old and bigger. <laughs> well, I am anyway. I'm not the I told Brother Campbell one time, I forget what we were talking about, and we were kind of, you know how we go back and forth with one another. I told Brother Campbell, finally I told him one time, I said, Brother Jerry, I hope the Lord shows me my faults as easily as I see yours. <laughs> Because it seems like when we're looking at other people, oh boy, I can see that. Boy, I can see that. But all of a sudden we look at ourselves, oh, it's not too bad. I'm not such a bad person. We all have our thoughts. As long as we're in this flesh, we're going to have those struggles. But when you're brought into the light, there's that overriding power. You see, we were brought into the light by something supernatural. It wasn't the law. Yes, I, don't get me wrong. I love the teachings of the church. It stands on a sure foundation. But let me ask you this question. You live in a house. Say you maybe just got that house. And you invite people over to the house. You show them around. Let me ask you a question. How many times have they showed you the foundation? Brother Cam, I just bought this house. Look at that foundation. That's one of the best foundations I've ever seen. You're showing them the kitchen, the bathroom, the bedroom, the living room. How beautiful it is. How nice it is. How you've got it all fixed up. Nobody ever shows them the foundation. But let me tell you something. The foundation is probably the most important part of the house. Because if you don't have a good foundation, you don't have a good house. And if you know anything about building... Years ago, when Brother Kim and I worked together, we were working on this big house in South Nashville up Green Hills, uh, Green Hills Road. And he was over talking to the builder one day. We were working on the first house there and the second house. And these were big three-quarters of a million dollar homes at the time. And Brother Jerry comes over. He goes, you're not going to believe this. So what? He said, when they laid the foundation for that house, it was like 12 inches out of square. You know what that means? That when you frame it up, you've got to figure that 12 inches out of square. When you put the drywall in, you got to figure 12 inches out of square. When you put the kitchen cabinets in, you got to figure 12 inches out of square. Everything. That's why even though you don't show somebody the foundation, it's got to have a good foundation. Amen. And let me tell you something. This house has a good foundation. Amen. But what people need to see is the beauty of the house. Amen. When they see the beauty of the house, they'll know the foundation is strong. I'm going to a beautiful home. I don't need to see the foundation. I know it's a beautiful house. You know why? Ain't no cracks in the drywall. It's just, it's solid. It's, it, that's what a foundation does. It puts your house on solid ground. We're on solid ground, church. But thank God when I came, when Sister Laura and I came to Woodbine Church, the first thing we didn't hear was, uh, we're on a real good foundation. In fact, when somebody tried to tell us about the foundation, we didn't want to join. 
But when I fell in love with Jesus. You know, it's amazing in just a few weeks. One time it's like, well, I can't do that. Then you get saved and you fall in love with Jesus. Oh, you want me to do that? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Oh, you don't need me to do that? I can do that. You know why? It's love. Right. It's love. It's love. You want to win this world? Win it with God's love. Yeah. That's why he called us. He called us this, this chosen generation. We have been chosen. Let me, I just want to say this too about the idea of generation. It can get, you know, when we think of generations, we think of, well, there's an older generation and a younger generation. But I don't think it's what it means here. I mean, Sister Vivian Campbell, she's got four generations. She's got her mom, her, Sister Tammy, and, and uh, Sister Morgan. And if the Lord tarries and, and Vivian's mom hangs around a few more years, it might be a fifth generation. Who knows? This is the common denominator we've all been brought into the light. That's that generation. You've been brought into the light. If you've been brought into the light, you're part of the chosen generation. And there's not one among us here today that's earned nothing. We didn't earn a thing. We didn't earn it. God wasn't choosing up. Look at some of the people God chose over the years. When it was time for John the Baptist to be born, he didn't go to the top none at the temple. He went to little old Zacharias and was doing incense. Old guy, him and his wife, buried for years. He's one of those guys that probably was chosen last. But God chose him and his wife. Of all the young women in that area that God could have chose, he chose Mary. When Jesus set forth his church, he didn't go to the temple and start choosing the smartest and the biggest and the baddest. He found a bunch of fishermen, I think a tax collector. He found all kinds of people and all kinds of lives. There wasn't one of them that earned it. When God does something for you, we haven't earned nothing. And as I thought about that, and as I think about that, this is the only thing God needs out of us. Our obedience. He needs us to just be obedient to him. And as I thought of that process in the relationship, when God called me into his marvelous light from darkness, and I realized, Brother Andrews, I had earned nothing. I had I I did nothing that would God would look at me and say, Well, he's really he's good, he's smart, he's talented, I can use him. I did nothing. It, what's, what's the first thing you do when you get saved? You start thanking God. Amen. You start praising the Lord. Amen. And what's the second thing you do? Just like I said a little bit ago. You start getting obedient. Oh, you need me to do that? God, help us not to be so long and maybe haven't seen so much that we lose that childlike innocence of just trusting God. Of just trusting the Lord. Believing that he can do the same thing for others yes. he did for us. Right. Brother Anders, I've watched it. Right. My daughter's dating a young man. She started dating and I thought, boy, he just rough his nails. Come from a hard background. Family broke up. He started coming to church, though. And I was good with that. A few years ago, I wrote this song and he helped me record it, and it's about the Lord. And he helped, he, he mixed it down for me. A couple weeks after he did that, he ended up getting saved. He told me afterwards, he said, I think it was listening to that song over and over and over again. His love came down for him. This past spring at the men's retreat, him and about four or five other young men got the Holy Ghost. Don't think that God can't do it. Don't put nothing out of God's possibility. God can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it and to whom he wants to do it to. And it's not our choosing. It's not our figuring out. I don't want anybody ever coming to Murfreesboro and me thinking, well, they have church God material. I know church God material. 
Only God knows what's Church of God material. That's right. What's our job? I, Sister Kim, I don't know if she's here now. She said it best one time. We're just supposed to love people. Just love people. Just love people. Because that's what God did for us. Amen. That's what God did for us. He loved us. We were so blessed. I don't know how. You know, you know, sometimes life's just a scattershot. When we came down to Nashville, we got married in May 2nd, 1981. On a Saturday, we packed on a Sunday, came down, head down here on a Monday, get down here on Wednesday, and went down on Lower Broad there, which is, hasn't been there for years, a little old Commerce Union Bank. We told a lady, we just came to town, we don't know where to go. She said, well, why don't you just go right down on I-24, and get off there, there's a Motel 8, and you can get there, there's apartments all around. And when you know, she just plucked us right down in the middle of all those people that go to the Woodbine Church. I haven't heard a thing. It's all been done for me, Brother Anders. By a merciful, loving God. And what did Jesus say to the disciples? Freely you have received. Freely give. This world needs to see a generation that number one is in totally in love with God. Because if you're not in love with God, you can't be obedient to him. You got to be totally in love with Jesus. And if He saved you, if you've had a supernatural event in your life where He has saved you, you should be in love with Him. And in that love comes obedience. Every church of God should be a house of love. I tell people that come to the to the Murfreesboro Church, y'all get beat up out there enough. You come in here, this is your sanctuary. You should be loved here and cared for because we have wounded coming in every day. That's the generation this world needs to see. A generation that's so in love with Jesus, they're willing to suffer, they're willing to go through. You see, that's what caught my attention. There were people who were so in love with Jesus, they were living a certain way, and it got my attention. And I thought, oh my goodness, never seen this before. I love Brother Dennis Lowry's testimony. After the reorganization, we set up 60 chairs in Brother and Sister Campbell's living room. That's where we had church. When it came time to sit in the living room when we weren't having church, they had plenty of places to choose. So there's a lot of chairs there. Brother Dennis Lowry came. He said, I found the spirit I've been looking for. He got saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Joined the church and paid his tithes on one meeting. I remember when we first came back there, we had a meeting there one night right after reorganization, and a dear old saint who was gone and passed on to her reward, Sister Harold, said afterwards, I see flames of fire dancing on the floor. Yes. You know why? Because there were supernatural things going on. God was working with us, and I don't know about you, I sure am hungry. Yes. I sure am hungry. I'm hungry for those days, Brother Anders. I want to read something very quickly. My son sent me this. Him and I talk a lot. I've got it here on my phone. Josh found this in um, Upon This Rock. He said, the little group dared to be different even at the price of disdain from other church groups. They catered to the teachings of the early church outlined by the scripture as best they could interpret. They preached about the church of God, but the principal discourses pertained to salvation. Despite the derision and criticism, they sought God and walked softly before him. They crawled on their knees in search of scriptural enlightenment, lest they fail in the least. They never searched bylaws or rituals for understanding or even better organization. They eagerly resorted to the Bible and tried to ascertain, if at all possible, just how the early church of the Bible operated. That's that generation. You want to know why? 
Brother, Brother A.J. Thomas and them did what they accomplished because they got a hold of this. They had a vision of it. I've been telling some of my young people at church, I said, you know, our young people, my kids were little at the Psalm Assembly. And we experienced something at the Psalm Assembly. Our children need to have a Psalm Assembly experience. They need to see something that will get them so settled and so on fire that they'll do it just like we did. We just come back home, start building buildings and organizing churches. We were holding what? Two, three, four services a week. You know what? We was in love with Jesus. We went through that song and sound. We didn't know what God was going to do, but we knew he was going to do something. And we walked away from there and said, I knew he was going to do something. And we fell in love with him all over again, Brother Jimmy. And we just took off. I want our young people to have something happen to them supernatural. That it'll happen in such a way. They'll just fall in love with Jesus all over again and just take off. We need to, this world needs to see a generation that's ready to just take off for Jesus. Well, oh, I need to be in a certain place at a certain time. No, you don't. Anybody who encountered Jesus got blessed. Amen. And you know why they got blessed? What did Jesus say? He said, I always do the will of my Father. So I believe that when he got up in the morning, him and his Father communicated. And if somebody was blind and they got to see, if somebody was raised from the dead, if 5,000 people were fed, it didn't matter what was happening. What it was was the result of this going on. It was like the fringe benefit of, of running into Jesus. My daughter's dying down the road. If you'll just say the word. Say the word, she's healed. Blind man, blind Bartimaeus. Oh, Jesus is coming. Jesus, heal me. He healed him. Why? Not because he didn't, not because some kind, he wasn't a magician. He didn't have some kind of power. This was what was going on. That's why Jesus was able to say, greater things ye shall do. You know why? You got to get this going on. You got to get this relationship with God going on. And we are that generation. This world's a whole lot darker than it was in the days of A.J. Thomas. I think we can agree with that. And it's going to take a greater measure. But you know, things are all relative. Things are all relative. For A.J. Thompson, it was dark in his day. And it's dark in our day. So let's be the light. Let's be the light. Let somebody see something in your life that says, he's been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. He's got something I don't have. I want some of that. How did you get that? I'm so proud of my daughter. Her and her boyfriend, Mike, they, they got some friends. They started having Bible studies. They had one last night. They're just loving them. And they're talking to them about Jesus. Because people are searching. People are looking. Yeah, the majority of this world want to go their own way. But I'm telling you, there are people who are hungry for the real thing. Amen. And we are the generation that has the real thing. Let's live like we have the real thing. Let's act like that we have the real thing. Let's love like we have the real thing because that's what's going to get people's attention. Amen. And when they come, just like Sister Warnock, and find Jesus, then they'll fall in love with Jesus and they'll fall in love with the church. Just like we did. We weren't a people. We, we didn't know nothing. You didn't know nothing. You know, really, realistically, we had nothing in common. None of us have anything in common except one thing. We've been brought into the light. We've been brought into the light. And we did nothing to earn it. Boy, how many places in this world can you go and get something that you haven't earned? A chosen generation. Are we going to be that chosen generation? Are we going to be that generation that's going to have such an impact on this world? 
It's going to take God. And we're going to have to go a lot deeper than what we've been going. I like Brother Priest out here today. That theme he had for BTI. Higher depths. Or de deeper depths and higher heights. We've got to go farther with God. Amen. Not that we'll be some kind of biblical expert. If we go higher and deeper with God, we should be going higher and deeper in His love. Yeah. And His compassion. We need to get to the place with God that we can look at a situation in this world and do just like what Jesus did. He wept. He was broken hearted. We need to get broken hearted over this world. I like what that little insert, insert uh, paragraph that Joshua said. It said they crawled on their knees seeking after God. Let's be careful, church. We're very blessed. We had men, I call them spiritual archaeologists. They dug out the truth. They got a hold of when, when Brother A.J. Thomason. He, once he got started, and they, they all got a hold of this spirit, they just start digging stuff up. This generation cannot rest on the laurels of what they found. Amen. You know what they usually do with stuff when they, they dig it up in an archaeological dig? They put it in a museum so you can go look at it. The things that they dug up out of the Bible are not to be put in a museum. But they're living, ethical, breathing, life-changing, soul-saving, blood, blood, sin, blood covering power that's in it. Those are the things they dug up. These are the things we stand on today. But people need to see the love that they had. We need to have that same love. It was love that provoked them to start digging. Let it be love to provoke us. The good works. Amen. Somebody comes in your path, just love them. Care for them. Why? I've learned, get up every day and I think of this. I'm blessed. Brother Henry's, I'm walking in the light. Because God chose me and I had nothing to give him. I had nothing to bring him. And I don't know about you, but when I think about that, it makes me want to sing forth his praises. So I want us to stand as many as we Can I get a piano player up here? I want us to sing a chorus. I want us to sing the chorus, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Why? For he has done